Hello and welcome. Welcome to our discussion on psychosomatics. I'm Sean Jago and um, I have the pleasure of being here with Linda Thackray and Christy Foster, um, fellow psychosomatic teachers and have been part of the health industry for a very long time. Today, we have quite a few questions to get through with regards to health and having a look at health through the psychosomatic lens. And we're also here because we are running a course in September and we are also looking at doing a different rollout with the course for next year as well. So we'll come back to some of those questions and discuss that further later. But let's just have a little moment just to consider what psychosomatics has been to you, Linda. It would be fair to say psychosomatics was life-changing from the moment I had a first encounter with face reading. I signed up the next day to the full psychosomatic training. And during the process, I had a huge amount of um, self-discovery and you know, I had actually completed 12 months of counselling before mm. I had even come and had the face reading. So I thought I was in a quite a good place, but I realised that what I had done was create like this bubble around me. So no one really rocked that boat too much. And, you know, I've, it was like a full sense of being happy with myself and where I was at. After the training, uh, I let go of a lot of um, that long-term baggage that was part of my world watch people's lives transformed had my own experience of how my life changed and I was in the corporate world at the time and since then I've you know been teaching now psychosomatics for 10 over 10 years I after the basic training obviously this master's and then teachers and I left the corporate world three years ago to focus on this full time so loving that loving working with both of you in the master's training as well and working with other teachers too on their teachers program. So yeah, it's definitely life-changing. Thank you. Love it. Christy. Hello, everyone. Psychosomatics. I'm so grateful for it. I had a client yesterday. This is so fresh in my awareness that um, I was, I see psychosomatics as a remembering of a deep remembering of who we are. And when I, when I say that, Linda, you were talking about, you thought you were doing so great. And I remember the first time too, that I had my face reading done. I thought, Oh my God, I look terrible. That was my first response. (laughs) My right side was so much, so out of balance. And, and I was leading with my mind so much. And I had also very similar done some therapy because I didn't know how to move what was inside of me. And when I looked at my face and I saw the imbalance of my masculine, my mind, I was so intrigued because I thought I was doing so well and I was so balanced. It was a wonderful reflection to me to tell me, no, there's there's more, always more to do. And it was such a beautiful invitation into myself. And then as I see people, um, it gives me such great gratitude to help them see who they really are and where the imbalances are, because that's harmony is what creates health emotionally and physically and connection to whatever that might be for you. And when one is that far out of balance, it's really difficult to find harmony. And that's how I see psychosomatics and spreading the word of there are, there is a way to help us figure out our own map which is how I see psychosomatics. And the nice thing, Christy, I don't know if this was for you, but I didn't realise how much the face can change. Mm. And obviously the right side of the face is the public face, left side is the private, and they grow differently if you're wearing that mask. But I was actually really excited to find later on how much the face can change as you do that internal work. Thank God it changes, Linda. (laughs) It does change because my face splits now are much more even and there's still a, it's a barometer for me to stay in check with 
where I'm at and how I'm processing and also noticing if I'm doing too much, thinking too much. Mm. I love that because I can, it's something I can literally see and pay attention to. Yeah. You can see those habits instantly. Blind spot. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And the face does change, which I'm really grateful for too. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. Yeah. What I love about it, especially with the face splits is um, when somebody sees into themselves, they're able to locate themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's that fish in the water style of experience. A fish doesn't know it's in water. So, so often we're unsure of where to locate ourselves or how to locate ourselves. And it's so nice to have a, a quick reminder of, of who's where and what is the current condition or the atmosphere that we're residing within. Yeah. I yeah. love it. Love it. Um, And yeah, it's most certainly one of the strongest, greatest um, therapies that I've seen that activates the living intelligence within a person rather than the overactivating of the mental intelligence. It's just that emotional component is just so beautiful. It's just divine. Yes, it is. So today's questions, we have had quite a few questions come in, so we need to watch our time. Um, and at the same time, the the questions are quite diverse, so it's going to be really interesting to <laughs> let's see how we can link these, right? Um, the first question that came in was actually about sleep and the challenges they're having around sleep. So this they're struggling with sleep, and I hear this often with a lot of my clients as well. And they're asking whether we have any suggestions around sleep. Mm. So for me, sleep is to move from the world of the reality that we live in across into the dream space. The dream space is a different world unto itself where the soul experiences itself or the um, creative consciousness experiences itself and it's in its own realm and how it currently perceives itself is also what sets up, I guess, the um, the streaming of dream time. Um, it's mm-hmm. kind of like, what are you watching? What are you seeing? What are you experiencing? What are you undergoing? Um, what's taking place in that dream space? What's taking place in that? Is it a restful place or is it an unrestful place? Are you able to step over into that space. So there's a lot of trust that goes on with regards to um, sleep. And sleep is something that we all have habitually been trained in, in one way or another through our family as we grew up. Mm. So if that childhood sleep transition has been um, well nurtured, then Going to sleep is a pleasure. But if there's been other habits that have been, um, that have created disturbances in that transition, um, then as an adult, some of those habits crop up. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, learning how to transition between the two worlds is, is fascinating and noticing the disturbances. So, um, my first suggestion is is to consider in your living daytime um, what disturbs you and how deeply does it disturb you and to what depth does it disturb you because um, soothing and solving some of those disturbances that are around you um, will also create a more harmonic space and a more peaceful space. 
um, when it comes to the sleeping component, there have been many different times where I've had my own personal processes going on where um, going into the sleep field was um, was almost like going to war. Um, and so that had its own distress as well. So depending on where that distress lives, how to address that distress. Yeah. What do you reckon, girls? I think you've summed that up really, really nicely. And I th there's a lot of people that really don't enjoy their emotional body and they prefer to keep themselves mentally and physically busy. So the chances are that their sleep is going to be less pleasant or less restful than people that are a little bit more available to sure, express yeah. their emotions, feel into their emotions. And you'll notice that a lot of people have um, problems with their teeth and with their jaws and they clench their teeth. Um, that is all part of that whole sleeping process and also holding on to the emotional patterns. So there are some things that are super basic techniques. Obviously what Sean has just suggested, you know, working with the emotional body before you go to sleep is the mm -hmm. number one suggestion. Mm -hmm. um, for me, then the second one would be to, if you haven't done the work on the emotional body, then to find a way that your body can be restful and really allow your body to sink into the mattress and allow your breath to do like a body scan from head to toe so that you're actually relaxing all parts of your body. And if you do have a tendency to clench your teeth, then also your hands are going to be clenched as well. So to position yourself in such a way with your hands on the pillow or the bed or somewhere so they can't actually go into a ball. Um, and if you just want to try that one on as a bit of a practice, I want you to just keep your hands like this. Yeah. And toes nicely relaxed as well. And see if you can access frustration easily. So what we do is we tend to access emotions more with if we're feeling angry, it's an automatic thing to go <clears throat> feeling angry. The jaw tightens, the hips tighten, the knees tighten, and the hands tighten. So by relaxing one part, um, it actually will assist in that process of a better night's sleep as well. Mm, and and that willingness to um, allow allow an emotion a space. Yeah. 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 Let it let it trickle through. Let it change. Let it. Um, be fascinated by what it wants to show you about yourself yeah for me personally like from the time I've been young um I can't watch scary movies like as an adult I still can't watch scary movies and I notice sometimes if I have seen something scary it is directly reflected in my um, night state but more so in the dream state like you know lots of um Chaos. Yeah, chaos or chaos in the nighttime in the nighttime space. Yeah. So I, I tend to know that about myself, but mm, it only happened to me the other day. I'm listening. But I think it's actually really important for maybe if parents are listening to this, because you could have two different kids and one's a hundred percent okay and they're not really overly sensitive to what they're seeing, and another child that it will directly affect at a hypersensitive level. Um mm their state of sleep yeah. christy what do you think well i definitely have a lot of clients that have had this issue i've certainly had it um mm. and the thing that's been most helpful for me and that i also teach my clients is like the body scan linda or to find a meditation that takes you through the body scan because usually it's the tendency is to stay in the mind and even to begin to ask the question, well, how do I do that? And what do I do? And, blah, 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 blah. and then it begins again. And that looping uh, keeps you awake. And mm. so to put on some headphones, so you're not listening. If someone's sleeping with you, you don't hear them. You're hearing either some music or a gentle voice walking you through what it is to feel your body in the bed. So you get used to being directed of what it is to feel versus needing to do it right and, and starting the loop again, it really begins to settle your system. 
And yeah. also um, sometimes journaling before you go to bed, if something happened during the day to physically write it down on a sheet of paper versus typing, that also moves some of that energy out of the body. Mm. And if you're upset about something, I would write that down. And I always tell people, please write without a filter because the pieces that we try to filter can be the pieces that are causing us not to sleep because we may feel pissed off. We may feel resentful. We may feel all of these things that have a judgment around what, whether we should or shouldn't feel that way. And then the mind stays open because you're battling with that inner self about what we should or shouldn't do mm. and continue. So the practice of noticing what's in the mind, writing it down, going through a body scan, and even doing some slow movement before you go to bed to feel your body, a, a dancing, some yoga, some Tai Chi brings you out of the mind. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's such a good practice. And we all are plugged into the world today through our phones and our computers and mm. turn those off Yeah, a good half an hour, an hour before you go to bed. So yeah, you literally because it eventually out. it eventually comes down to that um personal boundaries and what's in you needs to be you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not anything so else, not anybody else, just you. And also retraining yourself as well, because the body sometimes does, you know, same as like a like a youngster does need to be trained into a process. You know, I was working with a client the other day and she said, um, you know, I can't sleep. So midnight I got up, I did the housework. And it's like, wow, okay, that's um, that's pretty full on. But I'm sure a lot of people actually get up and do things that mm -hmm. they haven't completed, but to actually kind of go bed state, um, sleep state, and to give yourself permission. If you don't fall to sleep, to change your mindset around it and not to worry about how you're not going to get get it through the day, like you've got so much on tomorrow, because that actually agitates the sleep state space even more. And I think to actually go, okay, so my mind is awake, but let's let's create a restful space for my body and let's concentrate on the breath. And you know, sometimes even making a noise with the breath mm. it, it kind of distracts the mind from yeah, the yoga breathing, chatter. yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's creating an internal focus and an internal sound in which to connect with and remain connected to, which in turn connects you to your body. Mm -hmm. Much easier Mind to do need that. the focus. <laughs> <laughs> and that focus is you. <laughs> Instead of the world around you. Uh, right. Um, moving from one degree to another, um, we've had a really unique question come in. Um, it's somebody that's had a treatment for scoliosis back in 1979 when things were very different then. So they've had their a fused spine and a small rod put into their lower lumbar region. And they're asking about how they can approach a wholesome way for that aging process with some of those limitations that um, occur from uh, something as profound as surgery. So let's take it backwards just a smidge. And let's look at the location of the space of the body first. Um, and then we'll look at what construct has been created there. Do you want to go first, Christy? Sure. Now for her, it was in the lower lumbar. Is that what it said on the question? Correct. Yeah. And the lower lumbar is the, uh, the base chakra, the, the root system. Uh, has to do with safety, security, relationships, money. Um, and I really believe with our bone structure, when we come in, I have a lot of clients with scoliosis and the parts that they learn to manage is what I would call their soul imprint. That's what they're here to learn in mm -hmm. some aspect about who they are. Mm. 
So it depends just, on where it's at in the body. Describe scoliosis. Yeah, so scoliosis is a curvature of the bone, the spine, mm -hmm. and it can curve in different places. Mm -hmm. So for the person asking the question, that was right in the lower part of the spine. Mm -hmm. And what will happen in that lower part of the spine over time is there becomes a curvature in the middle part of the spine because the body starts to distort so you're out of pain. Mm -hmm. And so the muscles are more comfortable and over time, it does create a literal twist in the spine and then the muscles rotate around the spine and hold that. And it can create a lot of pain if they're, if you're not managing it and paying attention to the muscle uh, muscles around the spine, let alone moving the spine. Yeah. It can create a lot of pain. And what do you notice? Um, in the approach to that space in the body, um, what do you notice um, about the emotional component and sometimes the mental component that that lives there? Mm -hmm. When we're looking at the emotional component around the lower part of the spine, and many people have this, but in scoliosis, probably more so there's a contraction that happens in that part of the body. And the contraction emotionally can often be, am I safe? Do I have enough support? Mm -hmm. Can I move safely in the world? And for someone with scoliosis in that area, those are the questions, the emotional pieces that I would ask. And as the body gets worked on and loosening those muscles and or even you using a ball or something to open that up to really tune into um, the aspects of safety mm. and of belonging also is in the base part of the body. And is there something that stands out for you specifically when you start to stretch and open that part? Mm. The body will communicate to you what might be held there if you can give it a little bit of space and time to settle into the question. Because the body is intelligence and it will give you an answer if you can be patient and not go into the head too much about it. That's why it's nice for someone with scoliosis to have some body work. Yeah. To loosen up the bone allow the muscles to move in a different way so they can get used to unlocking. A lot of times they'll go back and you unlock them again. And that's part of the process of scoliosis is managing that movement yeah. within the lower part of the body and the upper part, because there's just as much pain in the mid back when there's lower back pain. Yeah. And now that it's been fused and, and often when there's, um, been a fusing that's taken place with the bone. Um, what now? What now, emotionally or physically? Could be both. Could be both, definitely both. It could be both. It's if That's what creates mental contentment. So, yes, it's <laughs> going to be both. <laughs> it will be. And... You know, I say the what now in that it's your body will always be communicating with you mm. in the what now. Do I need more rest? Do I need more movement? It It's an intimate conversation back and forth within yourself of what is it you need to feel supported. And that doesn't mean from other people. That yeah. really means from you. How can I better support when that's fused too, it might be more movement. It might be stretching. What is the body asking for to, so it doesn't continually stay locked around mm. that? Function? The pleasure of having the fusing um, is actually that sense of permanence as well, rather than fragility. Also safety. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. And that in itself often enables the tissue around it to also melt in one way or another. Linda. 
Well, I sort of thinking about the relationship of the lumbar curve to the neck curve. Yep. So if there's something happening in the lumbar, there's also potentially something happening in the neck. And so as we take a look at traditionally in psychosomatic with the um with the spine and we're looking at scoliosis, you're looking sometimes at a conflicting internal attitude that could be um, present in your own internal uh, mindset. So you might be born with it. So if you're born with it, it's going to have a slightly different origin to if it develops as a teenager. So we're taking a look at the emotional component, but also because it's the neck curve that is also affected at the same time as the lumbar, um, Mm. You're looking at how you voice and how you speak up about some of those feelings that can get trapped in the body that create that um, internal conflict. Mm, Expressing from that lower region. Yeah. And Mm. particularly around, as as Christy said, around safety and belonging and fitting in. So as you're working with the physical body to work with the emotional body that maybe hasn't always felt safe or may want to be in a different place to where they find themselves and you literally hear people go, I'm beside myself, which is mm. also one of our questions as well. I'm beside myself. So mm. energetically, when we hear that language, we know that the person is actually outside of themselves. Mm. Um, so yeah, that would be an area. And you know, I had I had whiplash, it's pretty severe whiplash. I got hit by an interstate transport carrier when I was um in my 20s. Yeah. <laughs> Then I fell off a horse and I hit my shoulders and my neck again. And when I started doing the psychosomatic work, um, what was said to me by Sean, <laughs> um, what was said to me was you're protecting your neck. You're over protecting your neck. You need to start to trust your body more than mentally holding it. So I was holding it in a more rigid pattern. And so that rigidity kind of lays an attitude of, it's needing protection, it's needing support rather than actually trusting that um, I can relax it and it's still going to be safe. And I think there are a lot of emotions, like when something's contained and you're protecting it, you're also protecting some of those those deeper hurts that go with either the whole rehab process, Mm -hmm. the trauma itself, or what created the weakness in that part in the first place. Yeah. So that was the best of advice that I could have um, had. Awesome. awesome. There's a chat in there, Christy. What's it? Yes. Thank you. All of this resonates. I've had a lot of therapy for my neck recently because um, the scoliosis. So that's a great point, Linda, to bring up around that. Yeah. Because it's the spine is one unit. Yes. And it's, if one part of it's going to be moved, all of it is moved. Yeah. Yeah. And and the direct correlation between the upper self and the lower self. So the heart is the bridge, but the lower three chakras and the upper three chakras and the way that they correlate between our higher knowing and our higher self and our, our lower self and our reality self. So that how that interlaces. Mm -hmm. In different cultures, we're all aware that we've got some students that come from different cultures. Mm. Some of those, some of the people that are working in the physiotherapy world, um, the difference between how many clients show up with scoliosis with different cultures, Mm. presenting also some of the masculine feminine attitudes yeah the bone being the mind and therefore also the dna as well so yeah that attitude that takes place between masculine and feminine and of course that can present in a family dynamic as well right Mm -hmm. yes absolutely and sometimes scoliosis what i've seen too is can be tied to an event in childhood not necessarily a physical event but an emotional event could be a parent dying a divorce where the child's body takes on that impact in a different way and the scoliosis can develop in the heart so around Mm -hmm. the upper part of the body Mm -hmm. and or around the identity which is the mid part of the body 
Yep. So there's different ways the scoliosis does develop. Sometimes it is from birth and then it can develop based on experiences in a child. Mm, its location is very specific to the individual yes. and what they're unpacking, yeah, what they're revealing or what's being revealed, what's vulnerable and um, and how to create strength in that space, strength mm -hmm. and flexibility in that space. Yeah. Awesome. Love it. All righty. There was the, there's two more questions. I'm going to go with the one about migraine first, and then we'll go across to one with regards to massage. Um, this person says, I keep getting migraines. What is it all about? Um, and who wants to pick up the question first i'll go first yeah so i find that um a lot about migraines is being a lot in the head overthinking um obviously there's there's certain thing about hydrating but we're also looking at generally how a person nurtures themselves and if a person is constantly out of their body and looking after everybody else's bodies um, or too much in the mind, um, physically the head can move forward, which creates the forward head syndrome. But I think it relates more to it's not the closed-heartedness, but it's like I don't have time for myself mm. um, and the activity is up here. So, again, doing some exercises that brings um, brings you back into your body and there's some really basic things you can do. One of the nice ones is grabbing the gateway point between the thumb and the index finger and squeeze really hard whilst you're breathing from crown down to feet. And for some people, that pressure point is incredibly tight, incredibly sore. And it's one of the points that we use in psychosomatics to release the extremities of, not the extremities, is that wrong? To release the energy from the extremities um, yeah. because the energy is trapped, right? Yeah, that's right. There's such an inversion that takes place with migraines. Yeah. Um, and I I have actually learned to um admire a migraine. Um because it's it's the body's way of shutting down what harms me. Mm. Yeah. The brain has taken flight to a point where um the body feels very disconcerted by what's going on and its only way to reclaim its position or maintain its survival is to shut everything down. Mm. Put you in the dark, um, put you in an isolated place or space and figure it out. I quite mm. like what it <laughs> insists <laughs> of an individual um, as much as that's unbearable for that individual. But yet um, it's the body's way of reclaiming balance because um, of the overactivity that's taking place. Mm -hmm. I, I find that it's uh, oftentimes can be an internal battle. Mm of Wit. <laughs> someone who's had a traumatic event mm -hmm. and th and when I say a traumatic event that can mean many things mm -hmm. but what I've seen with migraines myself is something is trying to have you pay attention just like you said Sean <laughs> and at some point you do go into the dark because you can't take in anymore literally in any way shape or form and i would say if this who whoever asked this question to have someone work with you about going into a little bit of excavation of where else in the body are you holding tension that might need release because just because it's in the head doesn't mean that it's not held somewhere else in your tissue and sometimes if if an emotional piece can be opened physically and or even 
cognitively with someone, it actually can release energy through the head. So the migraine, the pressure can be released. Mm. I think migraines are complex mm -hmm. and there's not one answer for any one individual because we are so different in how we process and every experience is different. Most important piece with migraines for me is asking the question, beginning the path of what, what am I not hearing? What am, what am I not allowing? And that's usually gentleness and rest and more feeling versus doing and thinking. Yeah. And, and the hearing really component is, it, is the listening, yeah. the listening within um, the willingness to take a moment to listen within mm -hmm. and migraines work differently with different people so some become sound sensitive mm -hmm. but a lot also become light sensitive mm -hmm. and, and so also not what are you not wanting to see mm -hmm. yeah 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 it's a and very intense it, pattern it's yeah uh, and um and it can often feel as if um your symptom is against you yet your symptom is asking a different way to train yourself yeah great question and it's very helpful to have a guide someone to work with you because it's really difficult to see those pieces by ourselves yeah it can be done and it's much easier to have someone that can see different aspects of you, how you hold things emotionally, your mental patterns to really put some of those pieces on the board so you can better understand yourself and what some of them might mean and which mm -hmm. ones can rest, which ones need to be addressed. Mm. And self-access or health is, is a unique balance between the layers that mental, emotional and physical all three simultaneously in the same place on the same alignment. That's how we access our true sense of self. We need to notice how we participate with those levels of ourselves in order to create alignment. Great. I'm looking forward to this question. This person is learning lymphatic massage and would like to incorporate psychosomatics with this. So, great question. I love it. Um, let's look at what they're learning lymphatic massage. So, let's look at the lymphatic system first and, um, and then we'll go in and explore further how psychosomatics becomes beneficial. So the lymphatic system is like the detox system, right? Linda, yes? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> the detox system of the body. And, um, and that detox system of the body um, requires movement. Yes, there... There are glands that sit in different stations throughout the body that help excrete the excess toxins out of the body and pushes it back into um, other systems in order to be excreted. And the, the so therefore the lymphatics themselves have this balance where it's looking for stimulation. It's looking for movement. It needs activation. It requires specific movement. So it's about keeping things on the move. So when things become stagnant, then the lymphatic system is what usually comes up as an alert. Yeah. Yeah. And you're also looking at like um, even things like breathing helps the lymphatics because they as the, as the lungs breathe you know as they move that mm. movement is creating movement for the lymph to actually move through in the same way the foot coming up does exactly the same thing so if people have the wrong kind of shoes as an example 
um, or they're not walking correctly, then their lymphatic movement isn't isn't moving in the same way. And it's a real problem, the lymphatic side of it, because people really need to be taught self-care. And, you know, we cover a lot about this, I guess, within the psychosomatic framework in the training. Um, you know, we take a look at how people walk, how they breathe, and, you know, get them to be firstly used to their patterns, um, but also what can they do individually to make those changes mm. outside of a training environment that they incorporate that into daily practice. Mm. And a nice one is, as we're sitting here, lifting the heel up, yes, weight through, the weight coming through to the ball of the foot and then changing it. So you've got one foot coming up, one foot coming down. And much mm, the same in much the same way when you're sitting on an aeroplane and you're trying to get that movement. Yeah, they give you those exercises to do on whilst you're in an aeroplane. But sitting at a desk, it's a great time to actually do those exercises too. Christy, yeah. lymphatics. Christy, you're on. The lymphatics are, a, I think, a really fascinating system in the body because they give us so much information. Um, and lymphatic massage is such a wonderful tool and modality because mm. it's so gentle, which I appreciate because you're working with that fluid and the level. Yeah. It's so light. Mm. And we sit so much, the physical aspect we're sitting and we have a major lymphatic drainage area in the groin. We have one through here. And so you figure if you're sitting with just a structural piece and you're not moving for eight hours a day, if you're working at a computer, you can only imagine how much the body needs to move in between and or after to get that fluid moving again. So you don't get pockets that um, start coming through the arm and through the groin that get really, really restricted mm, swelling mm. equals pain. And then you have less movement. So the more that we can understand why it's so important to move and all parts of our body. So if you're walking and you're having lymphatic issues, I would even use your arms and pump your arms to get that to open and move through the top, top part of the body because movement is so key. And it doesn't have to be forceful movement. Mm. It can be very gentle to get that fluid to start moving through yeah and i guess the signature that sits behind that is is most people would say but how does this take place and often it would be um if somebody tends to have a freeze response mm -hmm. yeah in life they kind of withdraw and they want to stop and hold life still rather than let life happen and often people as well, Sean, the people that tend to please others, so mm. their own emotional expression is not coming through, same as the freeze response, it is, um, yeah. but they it's contained, their emotions are contained. Yeah, the priority becomes everything else other than self. Yeah. I've been giving clients a new exercise to do for lymphatics. Mm. And um, because the lymphatic system is just underneath the skin, and as Christy sort of said, it's really super light. You don't need to go too too hard. Mm -hmm. To do a drying when you get out of the shower, before you even grab the towel, to hand dry yourself with your hand. So you've got your full connection of your hand drying all parts, but particularly underneath the arms and around the breast itself. Mm. And um, it's just kind of gets that body contact happening as well as um, that gentle work that the massage, light massage that you're doing to yourself mm. is in that area. And yeah. I would add just... to that, Linda, mm. just the psychosomatic piece because I am a nerd in this. <laughs> I tell people to do that all the time and I'm going to add to that. Please do, please Bless do. You. As they touch like their body, male, yes. male or female, to actually start saying thank you to the body and that you are beautiful and you appreciate this body because there's a disconnect happening because the lymphatics are not working. There's a disconnect about what you're feeling about the body and allowing the emotions to move. Yep. And so, yes, we can do a thousand exercises, but unless yep. we connect with the piece, the emotional aspect 
of the intelligence, which is this, saying thank you. And I'm willing to feel whatever message you have for me because I appreciate you, body. Yeah. And it's the slowing down process and noticing. So you even both said the pleasing and freezing. Mm -hmm. So it creates a state of not noticing oneself. Yeah. And so when you get out of the shower to do that massage and connect with how you're feeling and begin to notice what you are saying about your body too. Mm. Many people won't even look in the mirror because they hate their body so much. Mm. What are the other aspects happening within you if you have lymphatic issues that you might tell your body? And toxicity has a tone. It has a mental tone. It has an emotional tone. And um, and to diminish who we are has an imbalance. Mm. And the body hears us. Yeah, and the body will tell us. Yeah. The body says, please, I need assistance. Mm. <laughs> and so when you incorporate psychosomatics in with massage, um, lymphatics obviously we've just had a great conversation around that it also um, enables the opportunity for the practitioner to assist the client in comprehending a deeper awareness around what's actually occurring or where has it come from and I say to my clients often I'm talking on behalf of your body here because mm -hmm. your body is presenting um, with a particular challenge at this point in time. And that challenge has come from somewhere within you. So let me speak on behalf of your body and see what your response is about that. Notice what your response is to that. How, how much patience do you have to avail yourself to create a conclusion or a... Um, uh, or a reconnection with what's taking place as much as there's been a disturbance that's happening in your body. Mm -hmm. Nicely said. Yeah. And with psychosomatics, joining it with lymphatics, you're going to learn mm -hmm. where the swelling is with the lymphatic system and what exactly that might indicate mm. for that individual person and guide you what I love about the education, it's help, it helps to guide you in questions as you're working with someone of what emotions actually might be held in that part of the body. And so you're not guessing. The person <laughs> still is going to be able to answer it, but it's pretty clear on each area of the body, which you learn through the education of psychosomatics, of which every part in the body means and indicates it as a whole and then once you start doing people individually, that's when you can really fine tune that and make it more individual to you. And what I'd love about it too, is the person receiving the treatment, no matter what the modality is, really feels understood on a deeper level and seen, which is the key part of any modality anyone does. Included. It yeah, very, very important and valuable. Yeah, you're not treating my symptom, you're treating me. Yes. I think one of the nice things as well about psychosomatics, it doesn't always have to be a statement. You're learning the location as you know, as we just mentioned, but you can also utilize it as a way to ask questions of what you're already received, uh, like seeing in the body. Mm. And I think that's one of the areas that is a little bit different from some of the other modalities because there's so many amazing modalities out there but mm. I think it's a reasonably unique kind of format um, to how we work with psychosomatics mm. one of the earliest things that I took from it um, was is that it enabled me to have insight vocabulary emotional expression and physicality on all aspects of what it is to be human. Mm. So I had talents 
in some aspects and I can see that why those parts of my body operated better than others um, but there was a deficiency in some of my awareness of other aspects of who I am and therefore those parts of my body also were minimized in their um, availability or capability so it's one of those things where um, personally I was so grateful for psychosomatics because it actually enhanced parts of myself that um, were minimized mm. it does do that helps you become aware mm. in so many different ways yes should we have one more question it's a really big one but i think we could probably um we could probably still answer that question we've got time i believe mm -hmm. how can how can you let go of trauma in your past mm. delicious <laughs> Oh, it's a whole session. So it is a really massive question and a whole session. we can all have a bit of an answer on that. But what I would like to su suggest yes. with that one, trauma is about, it has an aspect of like when you're releasing it, education. It also has an aspect of your response to the event rather than the event itself. So in working with releasing trauma, we've got to take a look at your response, how it resides within you, uh, where you go within yourself and creating an awareness of some, maybe some of the patterns that are around that for you. And the most important part, safety in the body. And that's what we work with in creating the whole psychosomatic program, which Herman Mueller created for people that had experienced trauma and mm. we're looking to um, change their relationship with it and their internal and basically the nervous system, mm. learning how to work with the nervous system. Mm. But it is a big question. We could speak for hours on it. So that's my nutshell, one-minute answer. That was really good. That was a really was good fun. nutshell, can I say. That was a very talented nutshell. And um, for somebody who has experienced trauma in all sorts of modes and methods, um, relative to the age of origin also creates the awareness around how to create a resolution in that place or space within ourselves. Um, and most certainly uh, learning as many different techniques to ensure security and safety for the body, uh, for the internal resolution, healing and transformation that can take place in there. Um, and also understanding what the fuck peace looks like. Um, and I say the word <laughs> fuck in there intentionally, um, because it's one thing to resolve something within ourselves, but what are we? What does resolve look like? What does health look like? What does uh, peace look like? What does harmony look like? Um, they're the practices that are being learnt in replacement I say replacement makes it sound like we're removing something we're not removing something we're actually changing how something exists so it resides peacefully within us so history no longer needs to disturb me because it's enhanced me there you go there's my two minutes Kristen <laughs> hey <laughs> um I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of my own experience mm. and also the many clients that I've had um, that I've worked with releasing trauma in the body. Mm. If you can understand that when a traumatic event happens, it's like a, an energetic car wreck sometimes. <laughs> um, and it's how I explain it is shattered. And when you undo it, the car wreck happens again. Yes. Yeah. It does. And yep. 
That's why I think it's so important to understand who whoever did ask this question that yes, it can happen. And it, it will happen at the cadence that your nervous system can allow it to happen safely. Because your body will let go of it. There's so much cognitive therapy and people will be in therapy for years and their body or body will still show the signs of trauma, mm -hmm. like digestive issues or pain in the feet, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes panic attacks, even though we understand what happened. Um, yeah. yeah, to find a good therapist that can work with you and um, hold your hand in moving into that place within your mm -hmm. own body where you feel mm -hmm. it. Mm. It literally will allow you to breathe into your body because that part of your body has been closed off to protect it. And it needs to be done in a very safe way. I can't emphasize that enough with someone experienced to understand the, the cadence again. Mm. I've had many people come in through the years that say this happened and I want to get rid of it today. Do whatever you have to do. Mm. And, and I would caution that and also say move in gently because trauma is something that is very complex mm -hmm. we don't just get rid of it we work with it mm. and it lies and embeds itself in so many different layers of the body and then the individual also has a um, reaction to the existence of it yeah and that in turn um challenges them to find another way to be with themselves yeah and it's i think it's something that we had just had a question come in how is pain in the feet a sign of trauma um the feet when someone's been afraid for a long time for example mm -hmm. the arch of the foot literally yeah. can Sorry, what? I was going to say, um, when someone's been afraid for a long period of time, they may not know that they've been afraid, but the evidence of the feet and the pain yeah. in the feet show us the existence yeah. of the heightened nervous system um, and possible trauma. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So just like you were saying, it's the pattern of fear, the pattern of holding on. And you figure structurally over time, if you're contracting your feet, they're going to start hurting eventually because, yeah, the level of pain will go up as the level of holding is there for 10 years, 20 years. It reminds me of a story that um, I have been given permission to share this. One of my clients left her religion and mm -hmm. she said, I decided that I, this is what I was going to do. Her mental, everything around it, she felt good about. She said, and within a week, I couldn't walk. Mm. My feet hurt so bad. She said, almost thinking I had to get away. I couldn't walk. It was my client, which is a good thing, in that we talked about that and we worked on it. And the emotional release happened through the feet. So the tears came. Because it's a place of grounding for her. But it was the somatic response was within a day that her feet hurt that much. And then the pain went away. So wow. it can't do it. And then sometimes it's more complicated. She found a new place to stand. Yeah, within herself. And it was very profound for her to mm. see that the body reacted to a movement in her life that quickly. I think, Chrissy, it's interesting that you say that as well because I don't think, unless you're like a therapist, how you can really appreciate that the mind and the body can have a completely different story. Mm. And sometimes we hear the mind talk and then, I mean, like for me, I'll sometimes say to a client, could I just ask your body if it's in agreement with that statement? And they'll go a little bit slower, feel into the body and just cry and I think it is a real educational process to see how two stories can exist, coexist in the same body and show different um, effects. Mm -hmm. And all those pieces pull into migraines and sleeping issues. <laughs> what we just talked about. <laughs> yeah. All of those threads are connected. 
Yeah. And we're talking about trauma. So yeah. we are interconnected and it's, it's, it's an intelligent system and there is a map for that. Yeah. And the right. degree of discomfort is the strength of, or the intensity of what resides within the individual that's asking for recalibration, that's asking to be understood, comprehended, um, accepted. Um, it's kind of like when does the when does the board of board of members of the committee um, stop fighting and create a solution? Yeah. Good question. So I guess the next question would be if people were interested in learning more about psychosomatic therapy, either for personal development or professional development, how they could do that. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'll answer part of that. Um, you can start your journey uh, for personal development, which is often for people that are looking at, you know, how do I enjoy my life better um, in level one of the psychosomatic training? which can be started either online or face-to-face. -face. The formats are slightly different, but they're still the same, the same basic content. Mm -hmm. Or for people that want to add it into a uh, therapeutic practice or to expand on to what they're already doing within their therapy, um, which is an amazing add-on, um, you can go on to do level two. And the certification process, um, that actually takes about a year. So, one is the online is usually 10 days, 10 days, six hours. Um, the online, sorry, the level one training is six days face-to-face. -face. Um, the level one and two is 12 days face-to-face. -face. And after that, it takes about a year to complete the psychosomatic um, certification process. Mm. And for All most the people, studies and research. For most people, that will be five to six hours per week for about a year. Mm -hmm. and you can contact any one of us um, for information. Christy, your website is? It is christyfoster.co. christyfoster.co. Yep. Your website. My email is there. You can also, um, there'll be a new website very soon, which will be seanjago.com. And, um, yeah, you can find me in all the usual places and spaces. Um, on Facebook, I have a business page for your body and you, psychosomatics. Right. And mine is the faceandbodyinterpreter.com. So I have a group in on Facebook called Emotional Anatomy. You can find my uh emotional anatomy group through Facebook. And I post quite a bit in their educational posts about the body and little, little clips. So you can learn and you're welcome to ask questions there too. Awesome. And we're going to have regular um, monthly meetings of questions. Hey, gatherings of these Q and A's. Goodness. Mm -hmm. Could go for days and days and days and days. And days. I love it. Awesome. Thank you, beautiful women. Yes. Thank you for those Thank that have you. come to be here today. Thank you for those that are watching this video. Um, take care. Um, your body and mind will let you know. Um, Thank you very much, Savannah, for the clapping. <laughs> <laughs> Take care of all that you are. 